Welcome to On the Real Side. I'm Bob Mover, and my guest today is a wonderful saxophone player and arranger and clarinet player, you know, playing um, Mr. Frank Porowski. Hi, Frank. Hi, Bob. And Frank, to me, is like one of the musicians. What makes New York so wonderful in its way is there are, are not that many as great as Frank. I don't want to give you the, a false impression of that, but there are great musicians like Frank who you may not have heard of if you're watching this in, you know, Indiana or somewhere. Uh, he's not a well-known recording artist and doesn't get uh, mentioned in downbeat polls and all these kind of things, but he plays his tail off and has been doing that for uh, 70 years or so. And, uh, you know, and it uh, gives you a picture of what you, uh, one aspect of New York that you can find a musician like this, which you wouldn't find uh, elsewhere. He's a real New York musician and uh, it's the real thing. And yet somehow he escapes you know, the, uh, oh, what you say, the greater recognition of the public and the media and all of that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, we might get into that part of the discussion. But in the meantime, I'd like you to meet Frank and get to know uh, him and what he's about and what he does. I met Frank, uh, we go back, it was either 1968 or 69. Uh, I was about 16 or 17. And there was a jam session. Well, there were two places. One was called the Cafe London. And then there was a place called Woody's, which uh, we met there. Frank was a guy who would come in and uh, burn the house down. When, when he came in, uh, the level of everybody went up. You remember those days and we, uh, when we met, right, Frank? Where was Woody's? I don't know. That. Was Woody's Woody over near the half note? No, it was also on 23rd Street somewhere. Oh, okay. Not far from the Cafe London. You know, I'm trying to remember, but I remember that there was that place and there were the same, I think Maurice Mark, the drummer who had played with Stan Getz and a few people. He was on the scene. Uh, played with Maynard Ferguson. He played with Maynard Ferguson, I see. Yeah, he was a fine drummer. I mean, and uh, he ran these sessions and um you know a lot of uh, wonderful musicians i think if i'm right, john bunch often played piano there who became tony bennett's um pianist and i think musical di uh, director after ralph sharon uh left for many years and uh some of the, of the other cats that were uh that were around um I remember Bucky Calabrese and John Carisi and uh, a guy named Lou Glucken and a lot of you cats were playing the Broadway shows. What was the situation that brought these guys together there, Frank? Um, didn't you often play, you guys were playing Broadway shows and studio work. New York was really booming in those days. With, well, uh, 68, uh, I played... Uh... Promises, Promises, which uh, had a great trumpet section of uh, Alan Rubin, uh, uh, eventually Al Porcino, and Joe Newman was a uh, jazz soloist. Uh, Jerry Kale, huge <coughs> player. Uh, that was a great band with uh, Ray Beckenstein playing lead alto. And uh, that ran about three years, that show. I see. That was, long, and that was a uh, pretty good run in those days. And uh, so uh, we all doubled clarinet and flute, sax, clarinet, and flute. Well, there were those people like, that did that. You were one of those guys, too, that Ray Beckenstein and Romeo Penquay. And a lot of cats were. Uh, they they also did a lot of recording. Yeah, there there was a. That was the 
peak of the recording industry uh, years. The right. guys exactly. recorded all day long. Yeah, there was, um, you, you remember, like, those were the days of Jim and Andy's, where... And Jim and Andy's was the hang, yeah. Jim and Andy's was the hang, and um, didn't they even have a phone at Jim and Andy's? I was just a kid. I would go there with Richie Kamuka and Bill Berry, and some of the cats would bring me in there, and he had great veal scallopine. I remember that. And uh, was Andy Jim's dog or something? Was uh yeah, but I never knew that. Yeah, I didn't either. I just found that out. <laughs> In... I found it out somewhere along the line. He had moved from six. To, uh, he had another place before that. You you probably went to the place between uh, Broadway and Eighth, right? On uh, right on Forty Eighth Street. Uh, I went to the one on Forty Eighth Street near all the music stores. I think. That that was the one that. Uh, and then he moved over to 55th. Did you go to that one? Well, wherever he was, uh, I, I mean, I probably later on, I went to the one on 55th Street because I remember um, going there after uh, Phil Woods played a concert with Chuck Israel's band. And Lee Konitz and Phil and I went over there and drank Moscow mules and and Phil teased Lee about it. He said, what are you drinking? And Lee said, well, I like something maybe a little bit different. You know, a Moscow mule, which is vodka and ginger beer. And uh, and Phil kept kept joking with him. He said, yeah, you would drink something like that. <laughs> you know, and, you know like, Phil was more of a shot of scotch kind of guy, you know, and uh, so, so you play? Did you play on that with Chuck Israels? No, I didn't. Oh, I just went. I played with Chuck in other situations, but I never played many big bands because I don't read really well. Oh, okay. And I don't double, and I don't double. Yeah. All I ever wanted to do was play jazz on the alto, so later a soprano and tenor too. But yeah, but uh, uh, Chuck had. Um... A pretty successful big band, yeah. And then he then he moved to the West Coast. Yeah, he started teaching in Bellingham, Washington, I think is where he he ended up. Now he's in Portland. He's got another big band. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got friends in Portland that are doing that. But he did a series of nice concerts. He had different soloists. I think Phil did one. Michael Brecker did one. And uh, you know, there were a lot of a lot of cats, but I used to I, the first time in 68, I used to go to Jim and Andy's because I took some lessons with Al Cohn, some arranging lessons. And he had a studio right down the street. And after our lesson, he'd take me over to Jim and Andy's and they would give me red wine spritzers because they looked like Coca-Colas. <laughs> <laughs> so I could sit there and uh, drink with Al, you know. So you you took some lessons from Al Cohn, lucky you. Oh yeah, it was uh, extraordinary. I mean, uh, he had me write starting with two instruments. He just right, one plays the melody and the other plays counterpoint. Now we add another counterpoint line. And then he showed me how harmony is counterpoint. And we would talk about that. And, and uh, then he, he'd said, uh, he said, then all you have to do after that is just take some Count Basie records and figure out what they're doing, and then you can be an arranger. And <laughs> that's sort of what he said. That's how he did it. I, it was too much work copying all those parts and everything. But you're a wonderful arranger. That's one thing that you do oh, very thanks. well. And you had a chart recorded by Buddy Rich's band, right? In the class of 78 record, I was, Reading, you did a chart of Bouncing with yeah, Bud. That was, that was one of my early arrangements, uh, Bouncing with Bud. Yeah, I got, I ran into, um, I really wrote it for Bill Watrous's band. And uh, we played it uh, on a, uh, we tour, we did a Midwest tour uh, with Bill Watrous's band. Great trumpet. Was that the Wildlife Refuge, he called it? Was that? Yeah, yeah. And, and he had this great trumpet section with Mike Lawrence. Oh, I remember Mike. He died uh, young. And uh, uh, Sam Burtis was in the band too. 
and, and has recently left us. Yeah, and uh, uh, so uh, it, I met. That's where I met Chip Jackson. He 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 made that tour. He was playing bass. Uh, so uh, we get back to New York, and uh, a year later, I I think it was night. That was seventy nineteen seventy. That tour maybe. And we get back to New York, and, and uh, not long after that, uh, Bill moved to the West Coast, uh, Bill Watrous, a wonderful uh, trombone, greatest trombone player. And, and he and, died very young, too. He died, didn't he die in a plane accident? Or? Well, he, the story I heard is he, he was 78 or 79. And he got an infection, and you can't. And when you're that age, very dangerous, very dangerous to get an. So the was that old. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize he'd lived. I, I think he was seventy-eight. Right, Bill Chase died in an accident of some kind. That's the one I was thinking. He of. he died in a plane accident. That's Bill Chase, right? Bill Watrous. I remember him. That's right. He was on the Merv Griffin show orchestra. Oh. Yeah, well, Bill was a, a, a virtuoso trombonist. Oh yeah, always had, and he had his a big band uh, in New York, and then he moved to the West Coast, and he had a big band there too. Anyway, uh, so I, uh, we had played that uh, my arrangement a couple of times on that tour, I think, and uh, so a couple years later, I. <clears throat> I'm I'm on Broadway and I run into Dean Pratt. Dean oh, Pratt was in the it was in the player and drummer. Dean Pratt was in the trumpet section of the Bill Watrous band. Okay. So he knew he knew he knew my arrangement. So he tells me, uh, uh, he said, I'm, "I'm playing with Buddy Rich now. Uh, we're recording next week. Why don't you bring your arrangement in?" So. It was on account of Dean Pratt that that I did was able to get that in there, and I went to the recording session over at Columbia, and uh, uh, but uh, they played it. Buddy liked it, and uh, well, it has a great uh, uh, sax soli where I uh, took Bud's solos from three different three different uh, records. Oh, wow. And strung them together, and uh, uh, harmonized them, and for this sax soli, and uh, that arrangement still holds up. I'm sure, yeah. I'm, I'm, and it's sort of like a super sax, but with yeah. birds that a bird, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The soli, yeah. Yeah. So, I was uh, to hear that. so that was. Uh, that, I did. I didn't write continuously but uh, uh whenever i got the urge i'll put it that way when I, when i got an idea i would write an arrangement yeah. now speaking of arrangers you were very good friends and i guess i were backtracking because i know you did go to juilliard for a while i wanted to talk about that but did you meet who i mean to say is tom mcintosh yeah we were good friends we were we met at juilliard and uh one the summer of 56 uh 57 i think uh, we did a summer gig with uh roland hanna bobby thomas and morris edwards up oh, in uh, up in uh, uh wingdale new york it was a uh interracial camp summer camp a resort a music oh it was a it was just a summer camp for particularly for yeah, music just, just for uh for any for it was uh a place to have a vacation and they brought up acts uh oh, okay. played, so camp uh, as much as a resort it was like a resort yeah and uh, we played acts that came uh uh, I can't remember all of them. Jack Guilford, I remember, came up and did his act. Uh, 
there were some singers. Uh, any, anyway, uh, Tom. That was a common thing in those days. For, because yeah. a lot of people so, who are listening to this don't understand, don't remember those days. It's like a lot of resorts, like especially the Catskills and places like that, had bands that you'd play a set of dance music and sneak in a little jazz. And then the show came on. And they had, like, like, uh, like Frank is mentioning, a, a certain star of the week. That would be Jack Guilford is better known as an actor. But he also did some you know, song and dance type of things, too. Right and comedy, yeah, comedy, and so you would have different people. Some became very big stars, but at that time, it was usually right before they were stars, or they were stars that had kind of been stars and were kind of uh, falling back a little in their careers. It depended, but but well, Tom McIntosh, anyway, yes, that's where I got to know um, uh, Tom and. Uh, Roland Hanna was my favorite pianist. What a what a wonderful pianist! He he never got the recognition I think he deserved, but one uh, uh, wonderful touch and uh, swinging and a big I inspiration. Did, I did a European tour with him and Kenny Clark. Oh, nice! In the early uh, the early eighties. Yeah, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, Roland was. Uh, Quite a character, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he used to rock back and forth a lot when he would play sometimes. And and Billy Cobham told me a story that one time they were playing and Roland was rocking back and forth. And all of a sudden, Billy had his eyes closed. He didn't hear any piano for a minute. And, and uh, Roland had hit his head and knocked himself out. <laughs> 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 yeah, nice. <it> was, nice. <laughs> but uh <laughs> never knew that. Yeah, I hadn't either, but Billy told me that story. Because um you know, Tom McIntosh, for those of you who don't know, is a very, very gifted arranger, trombonist, <clears throat> and composer. Um, the first jazz record that I actually bought on my own was a Dizzy Gillespie record called Something Old, Something New. And one side of the record it was with with Moody, uh, Dizzy Moody, Kenny Barron, Rudolph White, Rudolph Collins, and Chris White was that quintet of Dizzy's. But on one side, they played like Dizzy Atmosphere and Bebop and Good Bait. And on the other side, it was all Tom McIntosh tunes. Um, November Afternoon, uh, you know, um, and, and there's the song, The Cup Bearers. And The Cup Bearers kicks everybody's ass. That song. <laughs> Is uh, it's one of those. It's sort of almost like a minor third giant steps, in its way. Yeah, I was there when he wrote that. We would, Tom and I uh, would <clears throat> at Juilliard. We we would get a practice room and comp for each other and uh -huh. tunes and work on uh, changes and and I had uh, one day I said let's work on the uh, diminished scale. And he, uh, uh, a few days later, he he tells me he says, "Look, look at this tune I came up with," and he played Cupbearers for me. So, oh. so it's based on the on the C, C, E flat, G flat, A. You know. Those are the keys it goes through, yeah. Uh, yeah, at the beginning of the tune, and it, and it's like a, uh, and the bridge is like the blues, so it's a wonderful song to play on, and guys like it, and it's been recorded a lot, a lot. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh, Tommy Flanagan played it a lot. Yeah, it's a beautiful record, a trio record with Tommy and Elvin Jones and George Morass. Yeah. The name of the record is called Eclipso. And their version of the cup bearers is on that. And uh, Dizzy's version uh, on that record, something old, something new. I mean, Moody eats it up, man. He just, uh, you know, just is like all over it. <clears throat> it's beautiful. And uh, did you meet James Moody? Yeah, yeah. I, I got to play with him uh, sometimes. He would, uh, and actually, he came to my gigs a couple times. I was honored that. Uh, you know, he, uh, they called him the gentle giant. Did you know Moody? Yeah. 
Yeah, I met him through Macintosh. Uh, uh, there was a period there where uh, Moody had a, um, it was right after we graduated in 58. Uh, uh, Mac and I kind of went our separate ways and uh, he uh, became musical director for Moody's, I had a septet, I think. Septet with Dave Burns, trumpet. Uh, can't remember all who was on it. Yeah, they made a couple of records. I I bought those records years ago. Yeah, well, Tom Tom was the um, uh, played trombone and, and was the musical director, and wrote all wrote a lot of arrangements for Moody, but Mo and and also taught Moody changes. That's that's a story. Uh, well, what taught Moody changes? Moody was just please tell me the story. Yeah, well, that's a story. The story I heard. And uh, I think it's true. Um, Moody didn't know changes and was a completely talented uh, ear player. And uh, but he wanted to learn. He wanted to learn changes. And so uh, Mac taught him changes. And when the the, the jazz community heard this. They were very, they were very just uh, pissed off at uh, at Mac for doing that. And really, he, he, and they called him in, and there was a, I think there was a, dis, a discussion where they called him in, and he had to defend his position of teaching. He's, and and he was right. What? How could that hurt Moody to know the changes? How could it hurt him? And well. It, yeah, I mean that's funny. I mean he was right, and and also time proves him right because Moody, you know, being the type of guy that he was, uh, James didn't do uh, Moody. He had to be called James. Didn't do anything halfway. So when he got into learning changes, I'm sure he did it with all. Oh yeah, he 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 ended up had, buying all the books and teaching himself, and then, but 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 who could play? Tenor sax like that, or now to say, he he's he's probably one of the greatest sax virtuosos of all time. Well, he was, and you know, I met Moody in a funny way. I was playing a, a one of my very first gigs in New York. I was uh, sixteen years old, and I had a gig with a drummer named Don Dore, and he had Ted Wald on bass, and Jill McManus was one of her first gigs on piano. And Turk Moros came and sat in with us, and I had not met Turk before. And I was 16, and Turk was about 22. Did you remember Turk? Yeah, Buddy Rich. Right, he was a baritone player on Buddy's band, and he was very good friends with Zoot Now, and, and uh, you know, was kind of a denizen of the half note. He was, uh, <clears throat> so after he heard me play, he said, you're coming with me. He said, get your horn, pack up, it's time to catch the last set at the half note. So he drove me down to the half note. We went to the half note and he introduced me to Moody. And Moody's about to play the last set. And he says to Moody, you got to hear this kid. And I'm like, oh no, you know, I can, oh, please. No, I, I, I want to hear Moody. I never even heard Moody live. Well, I had heard him live. That's right. When I was a kid, I went to the village gate one night with my mother took us there. And, uh, but I'd heard him live once, but you know, I wanted to hear his own gig, but no, he said, you come up and you play right now. So I ended up sitting in with Moody that night and he didn't throw me off the bandstand and seemed to like what I played. And he said, listen, man, I want to know what you're practicing. Here's my number. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to know everything about him. He was so humble. He said, you know, you're playing some stuff. Some of those things you're playing, man, you know, I like to know how you, how you derive them. He said, you want to call, could you call me up? We can talk about that. And I said, yeah, there's about a million things you play that I want to know about. So we started to talk on the phone and I would call him and he became one of my people that I would call up and ask questions to. And the one thing I remember him saying that was so beautiful, he said a lot of beautiful things, but one thing he said was he said, you know, I know I'm not an innovator perhaps, I'm not Coltrane and I'm not Charlie Parker and I'm not this, but I know one thing for sure. And he said, I said, what's that? I play Moody 
better than anybody in the world. <laughs> he said, and that's all you got to strive for. Well, <laughs> his early uh, uh, his early career in Europe, he had a hit record and didn't even know it. Moody's Mood was that? Yeah. <clears throat> Solo on uh, Moody's on uh, I'm in the Mood for Love. He he played that solo and it became a hit. Isn't that, was that because that was before or that was when Eddie Jefferson made the lyrics? Well, no, that was later. So that, the that was this was at the the first time he recorded. He recorded in Europe. I don't know all the details, Bob. Yeah, well, I, I remember the version that didn't have lyrics. You know, the one that the the song came from. That was uh, on one of those Argo records that were compiled, you know, the, the, around the time I got the Tom McIntosh stuff with Moody too. But um, yeah, he was. Um, but he, he was so talented and so uh, such a natural musician. It was uh, an amazing thing. And he, and he didn't even know he had a hit. How about that? Yeah, he was, um, you know, he, also, he, was, he was hilarious too. One time I asked him, he went to Vegas for a couple of years. Yeah. Remember he was playing in the shows in Las Vegas. And like, you know, most of us like couldn't, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Jimmy Mosher and I um, went to hear him one night and we're talking and hanging out with Moody, with Jimmy Mosher, wonderful saxophone player who Frank also knew on Woody Herman's band, which we'll get to in a minute. But he said to Moody, he said, so why? What did you? What were you doing in Las Vegas? I mean, man, it's so beneath you that all of a sudden you're sitting there playing for Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck and and all these things. And you know, I mean, you're, you're Moody, you know, you're a jazz player. Why would you be working there? And Moody says, "Well, my wife. I was married. My my wife gave me an ultimatum. She said, if you want our marriage to stay together, if you want to stay together, you got to get off the road. You can't be on the road with Dizzy the way you're doing it and your own thing. And you know, you got to ha have a normal life." And, and do this kind of thing. He said, so the only place I could think of was Vegas. He said, so I moved to Vegas and started playing those shows. And I did that for a couple of years. And, Mo and James Jimmy says to him, well, so now you're not doing that anymore. You've been back on the scene for another year or two. He said, what, uh, how come, what happened? Moody says, it's very simple. I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting back to you, I was just thinking about recordings. Oh, okay. And Jesse was telling me that she, you know, has uh, found this recording of yours because, you, you know, you don't have a large discography, but there are, you know, some beautiful recordings that you have made. And one is this afternoon in Gowanus. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, well, that's the big, that's my big band that uh, uh, features my son on drums. My son Ben is a fine drummer, and uh, he uh, he uh, is actually the producer of that CD. He he arranged. We did it out at Shapeshifter Lab, uh, Matt Garrison's uh, studio, mm -hmm. in two o three, I think, or two o two. I'm not sure when it was, and. Um, so there, I was telling uh, uh, Jesse uh, that there, I have two tunes on there that that I never copyrighted, and uh, and they're out there now. So I, <laughs> I I told her I'd like to find out more about that to be protected. You know. Yeah, me too, man. I've got tunes out there on records that I never bothered to. Actually, I I had Mover Music. And I don't know what happened to that. That's a long story. Um, Don Schlitten had the publishing, and then he Xanadu went out of business, and then he got that to EMI, and then I don't know who has it, and I won't get into all yeah. those yeah. things. You know, and so then I started to establish another publishing company named Emily Music with an IE, because the Nito Day had Emily with a Y, but and and that I was going to establish, but I never got around to establishing it, and I recorded for a Japanese company. And I got two of my tunes in a non-existent publishing company. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not the person to know about that. That's all I need to say is I wish, <laughs> you know, whatever you find out, let me know, you know. Because <laughs> well, you got Jesse though. I got Jesse, but she's, we're dealing with a bunch of other things 
<laughs> you know, like other stuff to copyright and the interviews and the master classes and some things. So, you know, my own, uh, my well, own. I think, I think we got to learn about that because I think the internet is where jazz is going. Yeah, I think so. You know, that, that's, um, I mean, I, I what you're doing, what you're doing is, is what is, is uh, what's happening now. With the yeah, I mean, class. I'm even giving master classes through Zoom because I, because of my physical condition with the emphysema, I'm considered a high risk. So I don't want to fly and I don't want to go anywhere with the crowd. That's why I'm not really playing publicly. Oh, that's the way to do it then. Uh, well, you know, we were talking about, you know, all of these people. Oh, you know. The oh, you wanted, you wanted to ask me about Woody Herman. I wanted to ask you about a bunch of things. You know, I mean, I wanted okay. to start from, from the beginning, you know, like, you know. Yeah, way, well, you got Perus it. You got it. The Frank Porowski. What do you want to know, Bob? <laughs> okay. Um, Frank, I would like to know. You're the only person I've ever met from Des Moines, Iowa. I did my <laughs> research about you. And that's the first thing that struck me is that well, I. Did you meet ever meet Dick Oates? I did meet Dick Oates. We're friends. Well, but, I played in his father's band. So he's from Des Moines, Iowa, too. No, they Jack. I met in Des Moines when he was getting his master's degree at, at Drake University after he'd been in the army. Oh. And uh, Drake is at the university in Des Moines. Uh, uh, that's right down the street from where I grew up. And I met uh, several people in the summer because the Drake band would uh, let a few high school students play in the band, and uh, gave, gave, the band gave summer concerts on the Drake campus. So I met Jack, and Jack ha uh, was getting a master's degree, and I was in 11th grade, and he asked me to be in his band. So for two years, I, I, I played in his band. Then after he graduated. Was Jack a saxophone player? As yeah, well? alto player. Okay. Uh -huh. he, he, uh, he took a, a teaching job in Jefferson, Iowa, which is a few miles north of Des Moines. Uh, and that's where Dick grew up. So he's an Iwonian. What do you call a person from Iowa? Iwonians? Iowans. Iowans, of course, yeah. I like Iwonian, though. Isn't that nice? Though? Iwonian, I like Iwonian, it. yeah. <laughs> Iowan. Iowan, yes, he's Iowan. Again. Yeah, so so when he was uh, uh, in his high teens, uh, he moved to Minneapolis and had a good career there. And he, that's where he co uh, connected with the, with the uh, Thad Jones Band, and they brought him to New York. From Minneapolis? Yeah. Huh. Well, I have he's on my list of people to do this. Um, he's a wonderful player. I guess. Oh, he's a beautiful player. One of my favorites of. Uh, so, so, that my was my, my uh, so that was my Des Moines uh, experience. And uh, I also connected with this fellow Ellsworth Brown. That's what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Tenor, and I was having trouble uh, transferring my clarinet technique to the tenor and uh my mother connected with the, this guy uh from philly ellsworth brown sax player who i was uh had went to my first jam sessions and uh uh worked on changes learning to play the blues and uh was he black or yes yeah and his son d'artagnan is uh, uh, a bass player who uh, played with bill chase's band oh, okay oh so there's a connection there with bill chase who i knew from uh, woody's band and ellsworth and it's, it's a small community the jazz community you know yeah i mean the world jazz community is actually small yeah, so I can imagine what Iowa's jazz community is like, you know. Um, 
but it's but, nice. But, but I saw I saw all the big bands. I saw Buddy Rich with uh, Harry James. I saw him with uh, I think I saw him with Tommy. Uh, I saw Walt Levinsky with Tommy. Walt Levinsky, and now I have his his clarinet. I bought it from Ken. Walt Levinsky, by the way, people don't know of him. When we drop these names, they should know he was one of the great doublers as well. Yeah. He was one of the people, played all the reads. On and the staff. a lot of recordings. On staff and, at NBC. And yeah, staff at NBC. And his own band. Good, good, good arranger. Uh, so, and I got to meet him too, yeah. But, so, yeah. I, where are we? Oh, yeah, so 1960. Uh, what do you, I, I got a call, I, I, Dick Turchin, uh, Dick Turchin's uncle Abe was Woody's manager. Okay. And Dick Turchin saw me at the union and asked me to uh, uh, fill in before, for a month or so. Uh, the summer of 60, I think it was August. And uh, the, the band was Bill Chase, Paul Fontaine, Rolf Erickson, and Don Rader. That's great. a great trumpet section. Status. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, J Jimmy Gwynn, I think. Is that the right name? Trombone? Sounds right. Jimmy somebody. He would. Oh, oh. Uh, Phil Wilson? Not Phil Wilson, but. Uh, can't think of his name. I I used to be good with names, but not now. Well, you know, you. I'm going to be ninety years old in uh, November. You've named enough. <laughs> I mean, you know, like that. What's that old joke about the guy, doctor? I can't pee. You know, how old are you? He says, I'm eighty nine years old. Doctor says, you peed enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, so, uh, but um, so when you but so you spent just a few months on Woody's band. I think it was just a, 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 six weeks, maybe something like that. And you mentioned that uh, Jimmy Dave, Moses, Dave Fig, Don Lanfear, myself, and Jimmy Mosier. Sax section. So yeah. I got to know Jimmy. Jimmy was great. Yeah, Jimmy was a wonderful, wonderful cat. You know, beautiful musician and uh, you know, great. But that was a, that was a good experience. And you got to know Sal Nistico, but separately from Woody's band, right? That was that was uh, later. Yeah, I met him. There was this uh, the Playboy Club in Jersey. I don't know if you knew about that. Well, I knew that there were Playboy clubs all over the place at that yeah. period. They were. And they had shows and uh, uh, brought in. I played Billy Eckstein there. Charlie Persip was the drummer. Oh. I met, uh, I think Sal and I were in the section. Uh, that's where I met Sal. And uh, got to know him. Such a brilliant fellow. Just, just wonderful guy. That's interesting that you say brilliant because he, I thought he was brilliant too. And to me, he was like an actor that got typecast. You know, everybody thought of him as sort of this this rough, almost like bull in a china shop. I mean, he was very graceful, but because he could play fast tempos and he could play aggressively, people kind of mistook, uh, you know, they didn't cop how wiggy he was, how intelligent his lines were. Gentle side of him. Was that? His gentle side. His gentle side and his, his sensitivity on ballads and, you know, yeah. just this. He was, uh, a, he was probably a genius. Yeah, I think he was, too. Yeah. And another one who couldn't work. Who could, who could swing like that? No one. No, he would just, you know, we just, um, we became very close friends. Like I was telling you the other day that we had this agreement that uh, wherever he was or wherever I was anywhere in the world, if it was our gig, the other one didn't even have to ask. Just get your horn out and get up on the bandstand, which... Uh, was a beautiful thing. Did you know Jimmy Wormworth? I do know Jimmy Wormworth. As a matter of fact, 
I did a record a couple of years ago, a few years back with my daughter, Emily, who's a wonderful singer and songwriter. We did a tribute to Peggy Lee and we used Jimmy on drums and Bob Cranshaw on bass and uh, young and Joe Cohn is on it as well as um, Saul Rubin. They alternate on guitar and uh, a pianist named Ehud Ashiri. But I played a lot with Jimmy Wormworth. He was on a couple of bands of mine and he came from upstate New York, right? He was one of the, yeah, he and Sal and- I met him when he came for first came to New York because he was from the same town as Tori Zito. And Tori and I were sharing an apartment up on 113th Street. What year were we talking there? Like just to get us in. Uh, 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 had to be, uh, oh. I was still in school, uh, uh, 50s. Did Tori go to Juilliard too? Did you? Oh, you know? he, 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 uh, he became uh, Marion Evans' protege. Marion Evans was one of the busiest arrangers in New York. I see. Because yeah. I, I know some records. I know that he's done some charts. Well, he did some Moody, some things for Moody. I saw some terrible things like that. Tori, Tori did. Tori did. Yeah, and well, he met, he met McIntosh. I, 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 through me, and uh, Macintosh was working with Moody, and Mac got Tori to write a, you know how rangers get busy and they can't do all the work, so he got Tori to do some of the writing. Right, and those were records that I bought when I was fifteen. I remember. Yeah. So funny, everything travels like that, and um, you know, so. So yes, the Tori Zito and you were. Uh... So Tori and I were roommates for a while, and uh, then I was then and and, and uh, that's when he kind of made his move to getting busy, really busy writing. Uh, Didn't he marry Helen Merrill? Very very talented. Yes, that's later on. Later on. And they're still, he's still alive and she's still alive. She, he died from emphysema. He was smoked. Yeah, I've heard about he that. Had heavy smoker. Well, do you know Ronnie, his brother? No. Oh, the drummer, Ronnie Zito. Yeah. I didn't know they were brothers. I heard Ronnie with Woody's band actually many years ago. Yeah, well, Ronnie, Ronnie's uh, extremely talented also. And Ronnie and Jimmy are really very close friends because they're from the same town you know and uh through tori and uh the, the... right well jimmy would always talk about the, the and the tenor players from there jr montrose oh is he is he, yeah, from... he from up there and joe romano and yeah nola that's and the Cal. buffalo that's yeah the... like the buffalo that whole area that buffalo north, Manchester, north, north of new york yeah upstate new york because he was uh Don Menza. Yeah, Don Menza is another one. Yeah, Jim, Jimmy sent me some beautiful tapes. Pedro Romano, I met him. I heard him and Sal go at it one night with Gordon Brisker. And Gordon, I met him too, yeah. In Cincinnati one night, an after hour session when Woody's band was in town, they went over to this place called Love's Coffee House. And the three of those cats played till the sun came up. And, uh, with a tenor player named Jimmy McGarry, who was a Cincinnati guy. You know, like when you mentioned Ellsworth Brown, you know, I thought about how in those days, every little town, not little towns, but smaller cities, had at least somebody who had never really left that place, but was a monster. <laughs> you know, there was always some- Well, there was, this, there was this pianist in Des Moines, uh, Speck Red who uh, played gigs and was, I think he was from another, maybe Missouri or, he, he was, like you say, he stayed, he was in the Midwest, but he made Des Moines his home and he taught uh, people that wanted just to learn how to play tunes, you know? On the he taught jazz kind of jazz harmony and uh, but he but he he's 
he's got some tunes recorded. I have some. Oh. Spec, Spec Red. And he 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 was a friend of this Ellsworth Brown that came to town. Uh huh. That's how I connect with him. So that's yeah. See, those would have been the cats you 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 know you would find there. And then you know in Cleveland, there's this guy Ernie Krivda. And you know, a tenor player. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys I've heard of but haven't heard, but you you know, you hear of their names. Um, one other thing we were talking about is you mentioned uh that you met Ira Sullivan when Ira was in Chicago. Um Yeah, I had a friend uh at Juilliard, Aaron Myers, who a he, he was a sax major at uh Juilliard and lived in it came from chicago so when i went to, home to des moines i would always stop in chicago to uh, hang out with aaron and aaron took me around and that's where i uh, i met joe farrell and uh, ira at a se uh, jam session and heard and then later on, I heard Ira with uh, Art Blakey uh, in Atlantic City. But Ira was one of my favorite players. Oh, so good. And you know Ira well. You knew him well. Yeah, Ira was my mentor. I met Ira when I was 13. And in Florida, right? Him. What's that? In Florida? Yeah, in Florida. He had just come. He'd been there about a year, a little over a year. And... Uh, he remained a really big influence in my life until a few years ago when he passed. Well, who could play trumpet and tenor? You know, uh, uh, sax and tenor, sax and trumpet. I'm I'm sorry I didn't take up trumpet too, like instead of uh, the woodwinds. You know, when I went to Chicago, this was funny. I went to a, a little session when we were there with Chet once, and all these cats came in playing trumpet and tenor. <laughs> a guy named Tommy Ponce. He played trumpet and tenor. Then another guy came into the session, played trumpet and tenor. So either they were all copying Iro or that was just a Chicago double. Like it used to be violin and ten years ago, right? It's like everybody on club dates played yeah, violin well, and Eddie, saxophone. It was a guy named Eddie Shue. Have you remember Eddie that? Shue played with Gene Krupa trumpet Trio. And trumpet and tenor. Benny, That's right. Benny Carter, trumpet and tenor. Uh, Benny now. Carter, trumpet and alto. Yeah, I mean, that was... Uh, yeah, so I mean, it was not an unusual. I mean, yeah, it was, it was thing. sort of common. Yeah, but but, but, I, but I picked. Uh, well, I started on clarinet, so uh, it was more natural to go to flute. You know, oh, Ira picked up flute in the later years. I don't know if you. I didn't play flute. Yeah, but he played wonderful flute too. He could play anything. Yeah, he he could. Now, when you you, you went to Juilliard, so you. were your mother now, your mother was a dance instructor, is that true? Yeah, I grew up in a dance studio. Uh-huh, and that's where you get that great time. <laughs> it was, it, it was uh, when I was 11, she she uh, told told us that, that the, they were raising her rent and so she was bringing it into the house and we made our living room a dance studio. Really? <laughs> so I'd come home from school and take a peek at the girl, girls, you know. All dancing. That's, how, how'd your father feel about that? He must have enjoyed it too. I mean, what, what was your dad like? My, I didn't have a father. My father died when I was when my, my mother was pregnant with me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I grew up without a father, but I, my mother made up for it. She was this wonderful person, very talented. I don't know anybody more talented except the sound is called me. And Ira Sullivan. <laughs> and Ira Sullivan. And James Moody. And James and Moody. Yeah, <laughs> there's this. Kenny Barron. Kenny <laughs> Barron, that's true. And, and Dave Kokoski. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, where was it? where was I? We were talking about your mother. Oh yeah, you're a very talented person, and yeah. having the dance classes in the living room. You come in all the school, yeah. and there's the dance yeah. classes. And um, so my, aunt played, do, like, my aunt played piano for the for the classes, and my aunt taught me from the age of five on. 
uh, piano and I got up to playing Bach uh, inventions, but I was crazy about Benny Goodman, so I wanted a clarinet. And then wow. when I was nine, I got a clarinet. So you started that early. So you were playing along with Benny Goodman records and yeah, I had I had this uh, Victrola <laughs> wind up. Oh man, that is uh... wind up Victrola, which had a which had a speed button on it. Oh, so you could listen to them slowly. I could slow it down. things, right? Yeah. No, but 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 when you slow it down, it changes the key. I know. I had a. So you have to key. you have to adjust that. Now I have in my phone this wonderful app. Uh huh. Uh, show you right now. Voice record. Voice record. Oh yeah, I've got that too. Voice record. I have you, voice memos. It's you a, can. It's got a uh, speed speed uh, button on it. Oh. You can. You can record. Then you. So when 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 I put on, I recorded Sunny, Sunny uh, Rollins Strode Road. I love that. Piece. Right. Sure. You know, yeah, it's F minor. So, yeah. so I can re I record it and then put the put the uh, speed button down, slow it down, and it doesn't change the key. Ah, yeah. Well, that's good. You know, now what happened with me is I had a, a fold up record player, one of those things. I'm a generation after you. Yeah, yeah. you're twelve years old than me. So I had the kind that folded up, and you had also had a 16 speed on it, and it would actually, you know, play things, and it would come out to almost a, a quarter, a half a tone, somewhere between a quarter tone, but a half step. It was closer to the half step key down than it was to the key it was being played in. So I got really good at funny keys, because when I was 15, 16, I was like playing with this record player. And I did this whole thing of like, you know, copying Bird and Sonny and, and you know, various people. And so if, if I got rhythm was in B flat, I got it out in A. And then I put it up to B flat, but the first key I would learn it in would be the half step down. So they, they became relatively easy. Though I still couldn't tell you that I'm as comfortable in F sharp as I am in G on that alto, but it was it was not such a uh, such a drag to play in funny keys, you know, because of this fault of my record player that you know it it was automatically you made it work. You made it work. Mm -hmm.